I'm up and running, hey? You're up and running. Hopefully without all the technical problems we had a couple of weeks ago. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting when you think about how we first started receiving messages from Silver Birch, which was at a, um, a seance or a sitting circle back in England close to 100 years ago. And wouldn't it be interesting to think of life back then, that there was no television, no internet, no social media, uh, no colour movies. You probably had the radio and family sing-alongs around the piano as part of your entertainment. And I guess a lot of the information you would have received back then would have been from the printed newspapers and simply word of mouth. Mm. So wouldn't it be interesting to think about how word would have passed around about Silver Birch and how much discussion went on about how legitimate, how, how authentic the messages were that were coming through from Silver Birch via his... his Medium, Morris Barbanel. It's just such a different world back then compared to now. Mm. And on top of things, the memories of World War One still would have been so fresh. There would have been so many people still grieving the loss of, of loved ones from the war, often without the closure you get from being able to say goodbye to a body, which just sort of demonstrates how important it is to be able to receive messages from your loved ones through mediumship to help in some way to get some closure, to be able to move on with your lives knowing that, yes, you physically lost someone, but their, their spirit, their soul is still there and still with you. And that's one of the whole, the main goals of spiritualism is to provide that, that comfort, that solace to us. And so it's just so important for those that are mediums to be able to, to work at their craft and be able to provide that service. Which is a bit of a long-winded introduction to this um, little talk, which hopefully won't go as long as it did last time, because I'm amazed everyone was still awake after last time, because it did tend to go on a bit longer than I was expecting. But as a way to sort of introduce what I'd like to talk about today, when I first came to Brisbane 10, 11 years ago, one of the places I was keen to visit was the Brisbane Spiritualist Church, which was that building dedicated entirely to spiritualism, which was yeah, opened by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the Sherlock Holmes author. So it was a fair bit of... church for the first time. Uh, can you hear me? Oh, just had a message saying I was muted. Um, yeah, when I went to the church for the first time, it was actually set out like you would expect a normal church to be. You like had your pews, you had the platform, these podiums, and behind the, um, and the back wall behind the podium in the the stage was a picture of Jesus Christ on the wall, which is a bit confusing because I thought, oh, maybe this is a Christian spiritualist church. And before too long, I was actually greeted by uh, one of the, the people that ran the church and she had a badge on, um, calling herself a reverend. And if I remember correctly, she had a bit of a, um, oh, like a, a smock, a coat or something, a white, it was all white with the badge saying reverend and I asked her, oh it's a picture of Jesus Christ up there, is this a Christian spiritualist church? And she said, no it was just a standard spiritualist church and yeah, that really got me thinking about well, what is the picture of Jesus Christ doing there in the wall? Which now leads me on to Silver Birch I've got a, big, a book called The Spirit Speaks uh, all the different books I've got to have different colours on, which helps you to tell the difference uh, between them. And if you are ever interested in uh, dipping into Silver Birch, the books like these tend to be a bit of a lucky dip. There's no real message or theme. It's almost like random messages grouped together. So if you're starting your spiritual birch journey, a really good book would be the philosophy of Silver Birch because actually that's actually divided into chapters with themes, so you can actually read you know, a whole chapter devoted to one topic. So there's philosophy of silver birch and 
more more philosophy of silver birch, and they're also av- available as eBooks now. So that makes them even more um, cost effective just to uh, start your silver birch journey with. But yeah, returning to the question of Jesus Christ, someone actually asked um, silver birch, how should we look upon Christ? And his response was, the word Christ means the anointed, and there have been many who were anointed. If the questioner is referring to the Nazarene, then his attitude should be one of respect for a being who came to show the way spiritually, psychically and physically according to the time in which he lived. Which is quite interesting because the Protestant Catholic religion places Christ above all else as a messenger of God and actually being the divine the Godhead, whereas, uh, according to Silver Birch, the Nazarene is actually one of more than a few who appeared at different times to pass on spiritual knowledge to the people according to the time in which he lived. So wouldn't that be really wonderful if there are actually people above us right now with the same level of wisdom and understanding and spiritual knowledge as the Nazarene had back then? who would then be passing on information to us that would be relevant to our times right now. And uh, Silver Birch continues, this being was not the great spirit and the great spirit was not this being. If the theological interpretation is accepted that it was the great spirit taking physical form, then the whole value of the Nazarene's life is lost and meaningless it would be easy for the great spirit to take human form and live almost a perfect blameless life. But if a human being born according to the ordinary natural laws shows what can be achieved, that is a worthy example for all to follow. So I think the point there is, yes, if if the God and, and the Nazarene are one and the same or spirit and Jesus Christ, the great spirit is the same as Jesus Christ, well, it would be no surprise that they'd be walking on the earth, healing the sick, um, healing the lame, um, creating miracles, passing on wisdom for the ages. But if this person actually, like every one of us, was born physically into this world and left this world physically, that has an entirely different message. It's more like an example of what our potential really is. How every one of us has that spark of the divine within us, just as the Nazarene did, just as other messengers have, that we all have the same human imperfections at one end of the scale, but at the other end of the scale, well, the sky's the limit. We are all capable of of lifting our vibrations as much as is humanly possible. And Silver Birch then goes on to say that Revelation is not unique at any time, in any country, or in any language. There is only one source of all revelation, the infinite storehouse. In every age, attempts have been made to flood the world with that amount of wisdom and inspiration and knowledge suited to to the conditions of the people who dwell together, which really suggests that the work that began with the Nazarene or earlier is continuing to this day more than likely through some of or all of us here right now, that in our own way we are still passing on the word of spirit. And speaking of spirit and the soul, um, Silver Birch at one point says that we may not all be great leaders, we may not all be great singers or great dancers or, or great creative people, but we all can be great souls, that we can all access that that spark of the divine that's within us and express it as much as we possibly can. So it's not, it doesn't really serve any purpose to compare ourselves to others because all we have to do is compare ourselves to what's possible within us and then embrace the spirit as much as we can to make that possible. I think Mary Ann Williams, Williamson has said about this, about who are we not to shine our light? 
who are we to hide our talents under a bushel? It's all within us. All we have to do is learn to shine that light. And going back to that um, moment in that spiritualist church, you had these people up on these podiums, raised on that stand just a few feet above us with the badges and their titles. And it was as if they were passing on lessons, teachings down to us, whereas spiritualism is much more of a level playing field as far as I can tell from what I've learnt in this world, that you don't need a badge, a name, a title to be elevated to pass on spiritual truths. You don't need to have the impression that you've learnt everything there needs to know because no one can possibly have learnt everything that there is to learn in just one lifetime on this planet. And that helps when we look at Christ. Christ was one of us in that we are all sons and daughters of the divine. We all have that, that spark of the great spirit within us. So who are we to put Christ up here? Who are we to put the great spirit up here when it's within us all? We all have that divine spark, one and all. And that makes me think of my father, who was a Methodist minister. And the only time he would wear the white collar would be when he was giving a church sermon. The rest of the week, he did not feel the need to separate himself from the people he was helping by having that that mark of knowledge or wisdom or religious grace. He worked as a human being, as imperfect as the human beings he was trying to help. And that's another mark of spiritualism, that it was there to promote equality, that right from the 1800s, spiritualists were there involved in the, the freedom of the slaves, uh, the anti-slavery movement, they were there with the suffragettes as well for equality of women. That to be a spiritualist is to accept that all people, all life is divine and therefore equal. And again, as uh, Silverbert said, we can all be a great soul. I mean, look at the what's going on now with the virus. A lot of the people getting such deserved praise are the cleaners, the people that are keeping you know, door handles sanitised and, and clear of any possible disease. They're doing what you might call such humble work that is simply not acknowledged by so many people, yet now we realise the value. So they are doing great work without being great leaders, great politicians, great leader, uh, writers, singers, whatever. So again, everyone has a part to play. Everyone is equal. And it's not just humans. Uh, it might be a, a chapter in this book, but there is a dedicated um, a collection of work from what Silver Birch has said about animals and pets in particular. And when he talks about pets, he says that as soon as a, an animal and a human are in the presence of each other and become family in a sense, that creates a bond of love. So that relationship actually creates and it creates something that gives. I mean, there's recently been uh, scientific studies that show that if you and your dog just look at, look at each other for a few minutes, all you do is hold eye, can to eye contact with your dog, it creates physiological changes within you and the dog of increased sense of well-being. And this is quite funny because as soon as I'm saying this, look who's just walked into the room. That is Russell, by the way. And the cat saying hello to him. And, yeah, so there's that bond of love. And that bond of love actually persists beyond uh, physical life and death as well. That according to Silver Birch, that once your pet leaves the physical world, if that bond of love is there, that pet will wait for you. And all these animals waiting for their, sorry, waiting for their owners are actually cared for by people in the spirit world whose you know, vocation is to look after animals. And so that when we end our physical lives, we will be reunited with our pets. And 
it's a, a reunion that may last a while. It may not because eventually the lot of the human soul is to be you know, moving ever onwards, increasing knowledge and its own sense of grace. grace. So eventually our, our paths will diverge from our pets and apparently the pets will then decide to head back to what might be the mother soul. They might be reunited with other pet souls. So all that comes from something we've created, the bond of love. It's the gift that gives. It's the gift that creates and gives us a greater sense of how yeah, we are not alone, that it's not just humans that are a part of this, this spiritual journey, that animals are a part of it as well. And I'm thinking that's it. How's that? Oh, Jim, you're on mute. <laughs> I muted myself in case Taylor barked. <laughs> you might have joined in the last bit. But it was really good, Neil. Really good. Right, thank you. Of course, you have to understand that to some extent, um, the, the Church of Brisbane was opened by Sir Arthur Conan Doyle. And Colin Doyle was very distinctly a Christian spiritualist. And he tried to have an eighth principle added to the seven principles, which was called the Christ principle, which is the principle of, it's really the all the ideas that the seven principles say anyway, um, without him being the saviour. So there was a, you know, there'd be a close relationship between them and the others. Uh, and of course, Christ, never said he was the son of God. He always said originally mm. he was just like we are. And it was the church when it was founded by Rome that decided he was actually the son of God and representative of God. Yes, so, they actually held a vote. They did. Of about 300 um, bishops. And I think there are only three of them that actually voted against the divinity of Christ. And they were not treated well after that. No, and uh, of course it was not wise to do because at that time they did decide they'd start killing people for excommunicating and uh, if you were a heretic you were in trouble from that, that day onwards. Because in England there used to be a number of churches including which disappeared because of the what, because the Romans said this had to be the one, the one religion. The interesting thing is that religion wasn't the Roman Catholic Church was actually the Greek Orthodox because the Emperor Constantine founded the Greek Orthodox Church, just randomly. And you're right, spiritualism, it's interesting, for many years there were no ministers in the SNU, the Spiritualist National Union Church. It was a relatively late addition. Strangely enough, Morris Barbonell was one of those ministers. Not quite, not well known, but he did become one. So he he could have described himself as a reverend, but never would, I don't think. That was a really, really good talk. I, I hope everybody enjoyed it. Interesting. <laughs>